Hello, everybody. This is Dr. David Jockers, and today we're talking about and we're answering this question, is coconut oil bad or is the American Heart Association dead wrong? And maybe you saw all the press that came out about the June 15th, 2017 article in Circulation Journal, and the mainstream press really took that, and they started talking about this idea of saturated fats and coconut oil is mostly saturated fat and how saturated fat is bad for heart, your heart and bad for your overall health. And we're going to really address that and dive into that topic on today's presentation. And so if you don't know me, my name is Dr. David Jockers. I'm a doctor of natural medicine and I really specialize in helping people improve their energy, their metabolism, their brain, and their overall quality of life. And this is my beautiful wife, Angel, my little boy's David and Joshua, and we live uh, just outside of Atlanta, and I have a clinic in Kennesaw, a little uh, outskirt of Atlanta on our northwest side. So if you're ever in the area, my clinic's called Exodus Health Center out there. So let's dive into the topic. Here we are, Circulation Journal, and this was, um, again, June 15th, 2017, and the title is Dietary Fats and Cardiovascular Disease, and basically this is a study that, um, in a sense, was a review and um, <clears throat> and it was done by the American Heart Association. So all of these, as you can see up here, on behalf of the American Heart Association. So all of the different authors that were a part of that, they're all part of the American Heart Association. That's who funded this review of literature. And you know, coconut oil has been really, really popular um, around our society. Sales are, are up significantly. People are talking about it everywhere, social media, TV. How, uh, how coconut oil is a superfood. And so I'm not surprised that this came out in a sense with the idea of debunking the idea of, co of using coconut oil. And so let's look at the American Heart Association and really what the American Heart Association is all about. And it was really started by a group of cardiologists in 1920 with the idea of teaching people preventative strategies to uh, to prevent heart disease and also to you know in a sense talk about you know different uh, <clears throat> different life-saving interventions that the medical model has and so the idea of, of creating this association great idea uh, fantastic idea but then every type of association needs sponsors and so they need you know they need revenue and so different companies come in to help sponsor them and help create education for the doctors. And so one of the issues, so basically, as you can see here, the new Crisco, the American Heart Association demonized heart disease, or I'm sorry, demonized saturated fat many years ago, uh, saturated fat and cholesterol, but they praised things like Crisco, right? And so they said, well, you know what? This is all unsaturated fats, double the preferred unsaturates in this the problem is that it is a trans fatty acid. And we know today that trans fatty acids are extremely toxic for the body, highly inflammatory, and really lead to heart disease. And so the American Heart Association now has a much better recommendation. They, they don't recommend trans fat, as you can see. They changed their ways. Um, and I believe this was in the early 2000s when they changed this. Up until then, they were still recommending Crisco and margarine and, and still a lot of doctors still recommend uh, margarine which is loaded with trans fats but you can see here this is much better recommendations like when you look over here and you see things like avocados and olive oil and it says love it hey i'm all about that olive oil avocados wild caught salmon nut seeds all really really good really good oils really good fats for the body um, so very good. I, I would recommend consuming foods like that. And we can both agree on the lose it. You can see that artificial trans fats and hydrogenated oils. Now, what I don't agree is the tropical oils. Like, why would you clump coconut oil in with trans fat? That doesn't make any sense that you would, you would clump that. And based on the literature that I'm going to go through, it's it'll be very clear to you that that does not make sense that trans fats should not be lumped in the same category as palm oils and then they talk about limiting animal fats these saturated animal fats and so the idea here is that saturated fat is bad that mono and polyunsaturated fats are good the problem though is that when we look at the American Heart Association and we start to look at who's actually funding the American Heart Association and where they're putting their label, they demonize these fats, but they're okay with sugar. 
And so you can see here, this is uh, the courtesy of the Food Babe. Uh, she did this research. She, she looked at all these, you know, high sugar rich cereals like French Toast Crunch, Lucky Charms, Cocoa Puffs, Tricks, all the kinds of cereals that are absolutely terrible for the body. And what they found was that they had the American Heart Association stamp of approval on them. So why would the American Heart Association approve of cereals like this when they're just loaded with sugar, really nothing healthy about them, no real foods? I mean, you look right here, Tuna Creations. And so we start to look for some ingredients and we can see sugar in there, things like monosodium glutamate, titanium dioxide. Uh, monosodium glutamate, that's MSG, which is highly toxic to the brain. Sugar is one of the main triggers for inflammation. But according to the American Heart Association, it's really all about consuming a diet that's low in saturated fat and cholesterol. So something could have a ton of sugar like Trix or Cocoa Puffs, but because they're low in fat and low in cholesterol, they're still considered good. Here's Bruce's Yams a ton of sugar, 18 grams of added sugars, but it's got the American Heart Association stamp of approval. So it's not even just the, the natural sugar in the potato, it's actually added sugar on top of that because of the syrup, and yet it's got the stamp of approval. And so the American Heart Association works closely with the American Dietetics Association. The American Dietetics Association really functions to help educate dietitians <clears throat> and in uh, most hospitals, if you have heart disease, they have you meet with a dietitian who's typically trained and a part of the American Dietetics Association. Now, here are the main sponsors for the American Dietetics Association, as, at least as of 2012, although this really doesn't change. And you can see Coca-Cola Company, PepsiCo. Um, here are the ones that, that most people really know, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, You've got General Mills, Kellogg's, right? So why are Cocoa Puffs and Tricks and things like that? Why? Because they're made by these cereal companies. And so PepsiCo, I mean, come on, Coca-Cola teaching dietitians, teaching cardiologists how, what their, their patients should be using. That's, that's crazy. That's, uh, that doesn't make any sense. Yet this is basically what we're seeing here. And so when we look at, you know, the problem with epidemic, with um, the types of studies that were done and that were looked at, these um, epidemiological studies that the American Heart Association looked at for this publication that was in the circulation journal, is that they're based on surveys. And when you start sending out studies that are based on surveys, you can get a lot of things wrong. For example, based on those surveys, they're looking at how many times people are consuming red meat, right, and full fat dairy. Now, typically, people that are consuming a lot of red meat and full-fat dairy also partake in a lot of unhealthy you know, lifestyle behaviors, maybe drinking and smoking and different things like that. These are typically people that are not as health conscious. Now, this is changing. The, the tide is shifting. People like myself, I consume red meat, healthy red meat, grass-fed, and we're going to talk about that. Um, but you know, in the past, it's always been that, hey, you know, healthier people consume more leaner meats, they stayed away from red meat, they consume less animal products, and those people were had associations with you know lower rates of heart disease. But the problem here is that uh, you know, again, there's a lot of misinformation because if we're if we're not factoring in the other lifestyle habits like smoking and drinking and lack of exercise and stress and things like that, then we're really not getting the full picture on this. Now, another study, for example, and this is really kind of how this works. So the American Heart Association is huge on this low salt diet. Okay. And so when we look at a low salt diet um, and we actually look at the research on that and look at heart disease risk, what we find is that the levels that the American Heart Association recommends, which is about 1.5 grams per day, were associated with very high rates, right? Twice as high a rate of heart disease as people that were consuming three to six grams of salt per day. Now, the average American consumes about 3.4 to 3.7 grams, okay? 
which actually is associated with much lower risk of heart disease than what the American Heart Association is actually recommending. So they're saying salt is bad for us, but what we found is that there's only about 3% of our society that's very salt, has salt sensitive hypertension, high blood pressure that's salt sensitive. Most people do not. Most people actually need more salt. And you can see even up to 12 grams of salt still had a significantly lower risk, about twice as low a risk of developing a heart attack as the American Heart Association's 1.5 grams per day limit. So what does that tell you? That tells you that again, you know, this, the, the, the information that they're getting in order to, um, you know, make these recommendations is wrong. They're not getting the full picture. So the problem again is that they're, they have, they're basically doing a an association. So it's an association not a causation. What does that mean? That means that they're associating things like, for example, they're associating saturated fat and cholesterol intake with higher risks of heart disease. And so that is similar to saying something like, and this is actually real stats, that as ice cream sales go up, the violent crime index goes up. And so you see this chart and you say, okay, wow, the more people are consuming ice cream, the more violent crimes there are in our society. Now, we can make a number of rationales for that. I mean, ice cream obviously does have a lot of sugar in it, and sugar can cause uh, more of a, uh, a response from our, our primitive reflexes and our um, basically our brainstem, which can cause more uh, emotional insecurity and can cause just lower emotional intelligence with our with our reactions and the way that we're living. However, really the main cause is that there's just higher uh, ice cream sales and higher cr violent crime index during the summer months, right? So during when the heat goes up, there becomes more violent crime. People are oftentimes dehydrated. Um, violent crime just becomes, things become more accessible. So violent crime goes up in the heat, okay? That's something that we know. Now, what else goes up during the heat? Ice cream sales, right? So people typically buy more ice cream in the summer months. And so it's not, we can't actually blame the ice cream for violent crime, although we could probably make a case if we broke down the nutritional elements of ice cream and what that, what that does to somebody's brain, to somebody's thought process, their emotional balance, and um, you know, just their overall level of emotional intelligence. We can make an, we can make an association and we can um, make a case, but ultimately the truth about it is that really it just has to do with the heat. And so it's kind of the same thing here. When we start to say that, hey, high cholesterol, saturated fat in our diet, that that actually causes heart disease, we're, we're very incorrect. And so what we know is that the Framingham Heart Study, which basically just follows these people in, in uh, Framingham, Massachusetts, and has followed them throughout the course of their life. So it's considered the gold standard when we look at cholesterol studies, basically showed that people with a cholesterol lower than 200. So typically, if you go in and you have a cholesterol level that's higher than 200, then um, you're cardiologist is going to want to put you on some sort of cholesterol lowering medication or start talking to you about a low fat, low cholesterol diet. But what they found was that those people with cholesterol lower than 200 uh, suffer for, from 40% of the heart attacks, right? So basically you, you more or less have just very close to a, the same risk of a heart attack if you have cholesterol lower than 200 than if you have cholesterol higher. Although the cardiologist will tell you that basically um, if you have your cholesterol level in 200, that you're great, okay? But clearly, there's more to the problem than simply lowering cholesterol, okay? In fact, many people are having heart attacks every single day who are taking cholesterol-lowering medications. So uh, cholesterol and, and their cholesterol looks perfect, according to the cardiologist. So it's really not the case, okay? And you can see research shows that people have a cholesterol lower than 180 milligrams, which, again, a cardiologist would say is great, are three times more likely to have a stroke. So they're gonna have some sort of cardiovascular issue. And so why is that? Ultimately, what it comes down to is, you know, really heart disease comes down to stress, inflammation, right, and high insulin. High insulin is gonna cause all different types of issues with the endothelial lining 
of the blood vessels. And so it comes down to insulin and inflammation. And insulin is really determined by the amount of carbohydrate and the type of carbohydrate that you're consuming in your diet. So really not the fat. Again, it's the carbohydrate content. So again, we know inflammation is the major factor in heart disease. And so as inflammation goes up, cholesterol will go up. Okay, so there is an association, right? Because there's association. It's meaning that so inflammation in the body goes up, cholesterol is going to go up. Why? Because cholesterol brings healing molecules, fat-soluble nutrients like vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E. Um, it brings these things, phospholipids, out to the E um, area of inflammation, the area that's under tissue damage. So if the body's inflamed, it's a natural mechanism for cholesterol to go up. And some of that cholesterol can be oxidized, uh, so damaged by free radicals and oxidative stress based on the integrity of the cholesterol and the amount of free radicals and oxidative stress and inflammation in the body. So we look at that and you can see different types of LDL. LDL is considered the bad cholesterol. It's just low, dens low density lipoproteins. Okay, and so we look at that and we've got large LDL particles. And so large LDL particles are considered very healthy because they're rich in fat soluble nutrients like vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin D, things like that. Whereas the small dense pattern B uh, lipoproteins, these small dense cholesterols, these are the really the bad cholesterol because when with small dense cholesterol, these are highly oxidized. What that means is they have very poor antioxidant defense systems, and so it's high likelihood that they're going to be oxidized and cause cardiovascular damage, okay? And so, again, we look at this, and we can see the main difference between pattern A and pattern B, LDL cholesterol, is the size here. And so you can see the small LDL particles, the pattern B, right, basically characterized by very high insulin. So when blood sugar goes up and insulin goes up, what else is going to go up? It's going to be these small LDL cholesterol molecules, whereas when insulin stays down and we're consuming a diet rich in healthy fats, particularly things like cholesterol, then what happens? We end up with these large LDL uh, molecules, okay? And these are, again, these are rich in things like vitamin A. A, vitamin E, so they're less ox they're less likely to be oxidized. Why are vitamin why are well, I'm sorry, why are um, these small dense particles so bad? Because look, rapid entry into the arterial wall, low vitamin E, low all salt, so much more susceptible to oxidative stress. And um, typically they're also associated with endothelial spasms, meaning spasms of the blood vessel wall. So again, this is about controlling insulin and blood sugar. And so we look at this, we can take several different people and we say, okay, all of these people, Jerry, Barbara, Tom, and Leslie, all LDL ratio of, or basically LDL, total LDL of 125 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so it's measured out. That's the overall volume of LDL particles, okay? Or LDL, LDL weight overall, okay? It's not actually looking at total particles, it's looking at the overall volume of LDL. And so you see Jerry has got basically mostly all pattern A, these large LDL particles, okay? He's at very low risk, even though he's got 125, which cardiologists would say is really bad, they want it to be typically under 100 LDL, okay? So they would say it's really bad, but based on the size of the particle, we know it's really good. Barbara, still fairly low risk because mostly, uh, you know, LDL overall total cholesterol particles are low and she's in that pattern A large buoyant LDL particles with lots of fat soluble uh, vitamins, fat soluble antioxidants on them. Now, Tom, higher risk because he has got smaller, he's got lower particle number here than Leslie and about the same as Barbara, but it's now small dense, switched over to pattern B, small dense LDL particles. So these have less fat soluble antioxidants. So now they are much more likely to be oxidized in the body and, and contribute to atherosclerosis. Okay. And then you've got Leslie here with high amounts of particles and um, they're all in that small dense category. So much higher risk.
So this is what's not being talked about with the American Heart Association. They're really not discussing this. They're just making a blanket statement that saturated fat cholesterol is bad for the body. And this is why we can't buy into statements like this. Okay, this is really misinformation perpetuated by the idea of, you know, basically this people who sponsor the American Dietetics Association and the American Heart Association who are making this statement that, hey, let's consume more carbohydrate rich foods and poly and, and unsaturated fats and stay away from these saturated fats like tropical oils, right? And demonizing them. But we look at people with the lowest risk of heart disease and we look at some of these tribes that consume very high saturated fat diets, like the Maasai tribe, 66% saturated fat, the Inuit, 75%, the Rendell, 63%. And then you got the Tokalu, who basically their main source of their diet, some of the healthiest people in the world, is fish and coconut, right? They eat coconut and palm oils all the time. It's their main fat source, and then they eat fish quite often. 60% saturated fat diet, extremely healthy people. So we look at people groups that are consuming uh, basically a saturated fat rich diet. We don't see high amounts of heart disease, right? Compared to the United States where one out of two people are developing heart disease. So in general, what does this tell us? It tells us that it's significantly, you know, it's just so important to keep insulin under control and that we do want to be selective with our fats, but saturated fat is not the problem. In fact, saturated fat is very, very good. In fact, better for you and should be at a higher level in your diet than polyunsaturated fats, which the American Heart Association loves. And I'll talk about why in just a second. But three steps to a healing diet. This is what we want to do to really reduce your risk of heart disease and to be healthy. Number one, reduce sugars and grains. Why? Because those elevate your blood sugar, they trigger high inflammation, they cause inflammation, and they cause <coughs> excuse me, that pattern uh, B, small dense LDL particle, right? So they, they cause that. So that's the big issue. And we've got to stay away from that. A recent study, 2017, British Journal of Sports Medicine, that I cite in the article that goes with this video, um, actually just recently came out, 2017, and they said, you know what? It's actually polyunsaturated fats, trans fats, and carbohydrate-rich diets that are contributing to heart disease and not saturated fats. So very recent study, British Journal of Sports Medicine, excellent, excellent uh, peer-reviewed study that demonstrated this. And this is why, you know, we got to reduce sugars and grains. We got to get rid of the bad fats. It's going to be corn oils. It's all these highly processed vegetable oils, corn oils, soybean oil, safflower oil, cottonseed oil, um, peanut oil, um, what else? You've got canola oil, things like that, just really toxic for the body, really damaging. We want to add in lots of these good fats. Okay, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And we want to change the meat that we want to get rid of grain fed, and we want to really go with grass fed, organic. Uh, basically, we're going with the wild caught animal products. So, really good, healthy, clean animal products. So, we look at the fats we want to use. We want to use these saturated fats. Why? Because they're highly stable. That means that they're less likely to be oxidized. Fat is really good in our body, but if it's oxidized, it's going to be, it basically that causes rancidity and that causes significant amount of reox reactive oxygen species, free radical damage, and inflammation in the body. So you can see these polyunsaturated fats and unsaturated fats, these things are much more likely to be oxidized. And this is why we got to be careful with them. We only want to use them for cold uses. So very important. So I'm a huge fan of doing things like grass-fed butter, ghee, right, coconut oil, palm oil, MCT oil, which is a derivative of coconut. These things are awesome. And this is what we want to use because, again, the stability of the fats are really good. So which to ditch, hydrogenated, partially hydrogenated oils, things like margarine, Crisco, these unsaturated fats, canola oil, all the ones that I was talking about before. We want to get rid of those and stick with the – saturated fats okay and then the healthy unsaturated fats as well so we want to stick with those okay and so coconut is phenomenal one reason why is because it is rich in medium chain fats and so medium chain fats very healthy for the body they turn into capric caprylic acid lauric acid very antimicrobial so they kill off bad yeast in the body bad bacteria and parasites 
and they help turn into ketones, which are a, an incredible anti-inflammatory alternative fuel source to sugar in your body. So using coconut oil, right? Using coconut products, coconut fats. So it's coconut milk, coconut butter, coconut flakes. So good for the body. I would highly encourage it. For myself, you know, I would say probably 30 to 50% of my diet um, is going to be using coconut products. So I use a lot of coconut oil and MCT oil and different things like that. So my calories, I'm getting a ton of calories from things like coconut oil, also grass-fed butter. I use a lot of grass-fed butter as well. So I'm trying to get a lot of these saturated fats in my diet. I'm a huge fan of getting, you know, something like 50 to 60% of your calories from good high quality saturated fats. I think that's a great idea. You know, I'm a huge fan of a high good fat diet anyways, where you're getting 60 to up to 80% of your calories from fats. So getting a, a vast majority of those from saturated fats is huge. Now, unsaturated and poly uh, to a degree are good, okay? But I wouldn't just focus on those and just do things like olive oil and avocados alone. I would make sure that you're getting a lot, at least a third, of your calories from things like coconut oil, grass-fed butter or ghee or MCT oil, those sorts of medium chain, small chain and long chain saturated fats because of the remarkable stability that those fats have. So ultimately, you know, to conclude this, uh, you know, there was a study done in 2015, plus one, they looked at, um, they compared soybean oil and they compared coconut oil head to head, right? And they took a group of <clears throat> rats um, on both sides and they compared them and they showed that the rats that were consuming soybean oil had higher rates of obesity, diabetes, inflammation, mitochondrial, disease, mitochondrial damage and cancer, okay, compared to the coconut oil group. So what does that tell you again? It tells us, you know, we can't just lump coconut oil into this category, these palm oils and say, you know, this is the problem. We've got to say, hey, you know, well, what is really the problem? The problem is poor dietary and lifestyle habits, particularly consuming a lot of <clears throat> processed carbohydrates and having high carbohydrate diets. So we want to stay away from those. We also want to stay away from the toxic vegetable oils. And again, consume more coconut oil and healthy saturated fats. So I hope you guys got a lot out of today's presentation. If so, I'd love to uh, have you, uh, have you uh, sign up for my newsletter or my YouTube channel here. Subscribe so you can get more of our videos and get more of the action. So anyways, with that being said, God bless you guys. Have, ever, have an awesome day. Bye.